Okay, so uh, we're at our final lecture, and um, let me find my pointer. So we've done rotational spectroscopy, we've done vibrational spectroscopy. So the last one in our sequence is uh, electronic spectroscopy. What we've been doing is looking at this energy level diagram. If we think about, we have a potential energy curve for some electronic state. <clears throat> within that electronic state is going to be a range of vibrational states. And within those vibrational states is going to be a range of rotational states. And we've been looking at transitions with, within those. Electronic spectroscopy is where we move electron density from one state to another in the case of absorption spectroscopy due to absorption of a, of a photon. So we are completely, whereas rotational spectroscopy, we're, for example, rotating the molecule a little bit faster. Or vibrational spectroscopy, we're giving the molecule energy and it's vibrating. In electronic spectroscopy, we are completely redistributing the energy density in a molecule. And this is going to uh, result in quite a large change in the chemical properties of the molecule. So, for example, photochemistry is a whole science on looking at what happens when molecules absorb light, what actually happens to their chemistry, because as different chemical species, just for that fraction of a second, they may go off and do some interesting chemical reactions. What we're looking at here is, so what is the energy required for such an absorption to occur? Or if we're talking about emission spectroscopy, what is the energy given off when a, a, a molecule returns from a high electronic energy state to a lower one? So what we're looking at here is this blue line, this electronic transition. And we can see, obviously, that its energy is very much greater than the vibrational transitions or the rotational transitions, obviously. And we can see this in our spectra. So here is a UV visible spectrum. Not quite the normal UV visible spectrum you're used to. It's got lots of detail in it. But the important thing here is our wavelength, or our y-axis, energy axis, is now much higher the kind of values we're talking about now are a factor higher, and um, we're into hundreds of wave no, of nanometers, um, which would be thousands of, 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 of wave numbers. So, sorry, if we think of our infrared spectrum, it runs from about 500 wave numbers to about 4,000 in energy terms. That's way up here, way past 100,000 uh, nanometers. So the energy of the transition now is very much greater, and the reason is is that because we are completely redistributing energy density in a molecule. We'll come back to this later, but you can see, obviously, as I mentioned, this is not the typical UV vis spectrum that you would normally get in a lab when you run normal um, UV vis spectra, and that's because normally we run such spectra in we acquire such spectra with molecules and solvents. Um, and uh, this is a gas phase spectrum of iodine gas. Um, the reasons I'll explain later, we're seeing lots of detail. We're seeing not just um, um, sort of a broad, featureless peak hole we'd normally see. We're seeing lots of individual, what we call fine structure. And we mentioned that in at the end of vibration spectroscopy, this idea of fine structure. And here, what this is called in electronic spectroscopy is vibrational fine structure. In other words, details about not just an electronic transition, but electronic transitions through a series of vibrational levels within some within some upper state. All right. So so th th this is sort of the last last part of the course, and um, we're, we're really going to look at this uh, qualitatively. In other words, I want you to get a sense at the end of this section um, that when you look at a UV visible spectrum and a, no a normal absorption spectrum, to have some sense of why it is shaped like it's shaped, um, what's causing what's causing a spectrometer to, to give this um, signal. And just to just to sort of prompt this, um, at the start of this course, we had a recap of atomic spectroscopy. But I just think it's useful to um, just go over this again, just to preempt what, a lot of what we're going to mention here. So atomic spectroscopy last year, really, you, you focused on this idea of line spectra of atoms and using the fact that lines appeared um, to indicate that energy was quantized and therefore transitions in energy is uh, a discrete amount of energy. So each of these lines here represents a an energy transition between two 
defined electronic states in the hydrogen atom. The fact that we're not just seeing lots and lots of signals or a continuous signal means that there are only certain possible jumps um, possible. And we use this in spectroscopy, but even just in terms of we can see here fireworks that are made of different elements will each have their own characteristic color, or uh, metal, uh, uh, metal elements that are burnt in flames will each have their own characteristic color. This characteristic color is like the kind of clarion call for spectroscopists to say, we can, we can classify that. We can use that as a way of, the, of analyzing and identifying a particular substance. And we can think about this energetically because we know, for example, in, in atomic um, spectroscopy, if we just think about electron uh, um, uh, and energies being um, described by principal quantum number n, and there will be certain energy levels, so n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, and so on, representing what we would call in the Bohr model of the atom, essentially shells. And therefore, we can say that the line spectra we see, so here, these lines that we see, represent transitions between of electrons between each of these energy levels. So, for example, we might say this low energy transition here might be due to the n is equal to 2, the n is equal to 1, transition. In this case, this is an emission transition um, because it's 2 going to 1. So the fact that we're seeing a single line means that is a characteristic value, a determined value depending on the energy gap between n is equal to 2 and n is equal to 1. And of course, you've heard of Lehman, Balmer, Passion, and um, so that can, that can the last one, but a good um, bracket. Um, uh, uh, and, and each of those, in turn, quantified the series of um, transitions uh, ending up at n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, n is equal to 3, and so on. But in general terms, we can use the Rydberg equation that, that determined um, quantitatively that the spectroscopic transition we see, mu bar, so the bar here it just means we're in wave numbers, is equal to some constant. The Rydberg constant, so or H just means the Rydberg constant for the hydrogen atom, upon some way of quantifying the difference between these two energy levels. So this, these transitions we see, we can we can we can predict what they're going to be, and in turn that means then if we know the energy of the transition, we can work out the energy gap between between n1 and, and, and n2. So this is giving us a way of quantifying the energies of transitions which if you remember is the core purpose of spectroscopy. We want to know two things. We want to know the energies of states, and therefore the difference between those states is the energy of the signal we see in spectroscopy. These are emission spectra. In other words, in our, in our fireworks or in our flame, we are using heat to give the molecule lots and lots of energy so that it ends up in this excited state. And then once it does, it wants to dissipate that energy as quickly as it can, so it emits it in the form of light. So we are seeing these colors being given off because this is emission um, due to these high energy states returning to low energy states. But of course, absorption spectroscopy is just the opposite. In that case, we will shine light at a substance, and that substance will absorb some wavelengths of that light and not others. And the wavelengths of light that it absorbs will be characteristic of the energy differences between two levels. So it will absorb this energy and this energy and so on. So the absorption spectrum we see will be the light that we pass through minus the light that's been absorbed. So that's why we see peaks um, in, in our spectrum. So it's important to note that with emission spectra, what we're seeing is a highly energized substance. We're watching the light being given out. So that's a transition from a higher energy level to a low energy level. But in absorption spectrum, what we're seeing is how much of, of the light that we pass through, what's not coming out the other side. So we see places here, these are represented by dark lines because the light isn't coming out the other side. We see um, lines representing where the substance is absorbed. So a UV vis spectrometer is essentially a light source that will irradiate, excuse me, irradiate a substance, say, between 200 nanometers and 800 nanometers, and we will shine that wavelength those wavelengths at a substance, and then the detector on the other side will look and go, okay, what wavelengths came through? Um, whichever ones were absorbed show as a, as a, a positive peak in the spectrum.
So it's just important to note that emission and absorption both relate to the same kind of energy differences, but emission is energy coming down, absorption is energy going up. Right. So that's the transitions, and they are all, of course, of course, worked out qualitatively by just essentially experimental observation and coming up with some way of um, using a constant to determine um, some some kind of um, generic formula for the spectroscopic transitions that were being observed experimentally. And then, of course, along came quantum chemistry, along came Schrodinger, and Schrodinger used, um, uh, the Schrodinger equation is used to um, come up with energies of these states. So, so far, I've just been calling this first state here n is equal to 1. I've no idea of its energy. I've no idea of this state's energy. All spectroscopy is telling me is the difference between the two. I'm able to see this difference experimentally. So in our line spectrum, we're able to see that experimentally. But Schrodinger gives us a way of actually quantifying these energy levels themselves. Depending on the principal quantum number n, we can come up with some expression. Planck's constant, constant is h, speed of light is c, or is some constant. Um, and n is the energy of the principal, the principal quantum number. And look what happens. We get an expression that looks identical to, um, or at least uses many of the, the, the um, terminology that we use in uh, what was derived from the Bohr model. And even more importantly, what we're interested in, I suppose, is differences. So what we've got now is we've got a way of not just saying this is n is equal to 1, but a way of quantifying quantifying that. So this is in joules, um, the, um, the energy of that um, energy level, or h if it's the hydrogen level. So we have a way of quantifying these these energies. Great, because that's the second part of the trust that we like to know. We like to know the uh, energies of the states and the differences in energies. So now we can use Schrodinger not just to quantify the energies, but to quantify from a quantum mechanical basis the differences in those energies. How do we do that? How do we do that? Well, it's just one energy level minus the other. So we can say that. Um, the, uh, sorry, let's skip on to the next slide. We can say that the difference in energy between two states will be the energy of the first state minus the energy of the second. So here again, the diagram is showing emission, but the same is true for absorption. And what we end up with is an energy of the upper state minus the energy of the lower state. All right, so this is before um, an absorption. And we end up with an expression that is the same as the expression that's derived from the uh, Rydberg formula. In other words, this OR value can be utilized um, in um, spectroscopic transitions. In other words, the quantum chemistry lines up with what we observe in the Bohr model. But this is giving us now a fundamental theoretical basis for those energy levels. All right. So all of this can be basically summarized by saying we can determine the spectroscopic transition between two energy levels by thinking about the um, principal quantum number of those energy levels. In the same way as we can determine the spectroscopic transition between two rotational states or two vibrational states by thinking about the rotational quantum number or the vibrational quantum number. It's all, all the same. They just have their own individual expressions. So, so good so far. Ah, gee. So, so far we've been sort of brushing aside a little bit issues associated with um, uh, intensity of uh, spect spectroscopic transitions. And we can see here pretty quickly, I mean, I've been talking about atomic spectra, and even, even then we can see, you know, we're, we're, we're starting to deal with very large numbers of possible transitions. And therefore, um, we need some way of deciding um, how can we feasibly think about, when we look at a spectrum, how can we start to think about well, what, are, what, what transitions do these, um, do these peaks that we're seeing in the spectrum actually relate to? And one of the kind of core governing principles of spectroscopy are issues associated with selection rules. So we've already come across this a little bit, but I just wanted to formalize it um, in, in, in greater detail now. When we think about a spectroscopic transition, all right, the first thing we want to think about is the feasibility of that transition. And the way we consider that feasibility is due to is probability. And we've already looked at this. Well, we talked about the Boltzmann distribution. 
what we said was, um, is a molecule, um, if a molecule has several energetic states available to it, which it does, well, a transition will only occur from one of those states if there's molecules existing in that state. So, for example, if we have a molecule that's rotating at a particular um, um, rate, that will mean that that's existing in a particular rotational state. But there might be the next level up, the molecule mightn't be, very few molecules might be rotating at an energy that equates to that state. So therefore, we're, we're very likely going to see transitions in the first of those energy states, in other words, where there's a lot of molecules, than we are with the second. Or very simply, if there's no molecules in a particular state, well, then we're not going to see transitions from that state. So that idea of probability is a way of giving us um, a sense of the intensity of a transition. The intensity of a transition will really be governed by whether a molecule actually exists in that state in the first place. More generally, intensities of transitions can be aligned to what we've already looked at in general terms and what we will call a gross selection rule. In other words, is the molecule going to absorb light in the first place? So we said that, for example, for rotational spectroscopy and vibrational spectroscopy, there has to be some dipole change as a result of the rotation or the vibration, because that's the way that the um, essentially the transition moment integral brings together the wavelength of light and the wavelength of the dipole moment change. And for those to kind of overlap, for light absorption to occur, that that, that, that dipole moment needs to change at a similar frequency to the the light being absorbed. So the gross selection rule, and that's very easy in our case, uh, is that there needs to be a dipole moment change uh, in rotation or vibration or indeed electronic transitions for light to be absorbed. So we can say if there isn't, well then light isn't going to be absorbed. And then there are particular quantum mechanical rules that govern individual transitions. Now in this course we're just going to look at these very loosely and very qualitatively. I'll come to it at the end of this lecture. Because what you need to have is some molecular symmetry that you'll cover in third year to really go into detail on this, to really think about well, why, when we look at wave functions in, uh, 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 of mole um, uh, orbitals in molecules, why will light absorb or why will it not absorb? So you need to be able to use molecular symmetry techniques to apply. But, but essentially what we can say at this stage is there will be specific selection rules that say, within specific types of spectroscopy, that say whether or not transitions are allowed. And we've already looked at this, for example, in rotational spectroscopy. We said delta J must be plus or minus 1. Similarly, we said delta uh, V in vibration spectroscopy um, must be an integer. And now, again, we can say in electronic spectroscopy, delta N can be any value, which we already know because if you go back to uh, our old friend here, we can see delta n at a whole range of different values. We've got n2 going to n1, n3 going to n1, and so on. Lots and lots of possibilities here. So I'm just mentioning this issue of selection rule because it comes up a lot in spectroscopy, but really all we want to do is think about when we see spectra, and we see sometimes signals are very intense, and sometimes signals are very weak. There are a variety of reasons for that. One is definitely Boltzmann how many molecules are in the state in the first place that a transition is occurring from, but others are due to what are called selection rules. And this becomes important when the selection rules on paper and the selection rules in reality don't agree. So an example of this is something called the heavy atom effect. And the heavy atom effect is where we might have a molecule, let's say we have an organic molecule, and it has uh, bromine on it. So there's a carbon-bromine bond in there along with lots of carbon hydrogen bonds. Bromine is an anchor compared to, compared to the other atoms there. So on paper, this might look like a very symmetric molecule. But in reality, bromine is completely distorting the shape of this molecule. And therefore, the symmetric rules that we will apply in third year molecular symmetry um, to, to, to describe the symmetry of this molecule will completely differ on paper than they do in reality. So sometimes in spectra, we see transitions that we don't expect to appear based on the rules but they do appear anyway. And in general terms, when you see extinction coefficients, which you've come across in the Beer Lambert law, very low extinction coefficients, as in around about 1 to 10, are usually molecules where we don't expect to see a transition quantum mechanically, according to the selection rules, but there's something happening in reality that means a little it's, it's been 
partially allowed. Right. Okay, so where are we? Atomic spectroscopy has told us we can uh, describe the energy of states using Schrodinger, and we can easily quantify the differences between those energies. What now happens when we move on beyond um, molecules? Well, what we are not going to do in this course is describe the energies of um, molecular orbitals. Um, and you pick that up in chemistry 3. What we're going to focus on here in, is why do we see UV vis spectra of particular shape and of particular um, uh, um, structure, intensity. So we said we have a, an electronic ground state. So our course so far, before we move on to electronic spectroscopy, lives in this region. We looked at vibrational transitions between each of these major green lines. And within each of these major lines, there are a subset of rotational levels, and we saw rotational transitions there. In electronic spectroscopy, we are moving the electron density completely from one electronic state. Let's say it's the highest occupied molecular orbital, maybe a pi pi star bond in the um, in a carbonyl compound, to some electronic excited state, maybe the LUMO, which is a pi pi star antibonding orbital. So you can imagine moving electron density from a bonding orbital to an antibonding orbital is completely changing the electronic structure of the molecule. Just for just for a flash of a second, it'll be back down again in a couple of nanoseconds. So what happens in that transition? Well, we can see our arrows here are going from the lowest vibrational level in the ground state. Why? Because Boltzmann tells us, remember we did the calculation last time, Boltzmann tells us that pretty much all molecules exist in the lowest vibrational state. Everything almost exists in V is equal to zero. So that means I could draw arrows from one and from two and from three. They would happen. But spectroscopically, we won't see those in practice because the intensity of those peaks would be so long, so, so, so low, because very few molecules would be in the V is equal to one or the V is equal to two or the V is equal to three state. So all of our arrows here start off in the ground vibrational state. And they go up to upper vibrational states, depending on the wavelength of light that we, that we point at. So the more energy we give them, the higher capacity the system has to absorb that radiation. And we will see a whole variety of options. So we will see what we call 0 to 0, 0 to 1 upstairs, 0 to 2 upstairs, and so on. And instead of calling these upstairs and downstairs, which I like to do, spectroscopists call the lower states that are double prime, in other words, the prime prime, and the upper state that are single prime, in other words, D prime. So this transition here will be V prime prime is equal to zero, going to V prime is equal to one. Okay, so what we will see is we will see a series of transitions, zero to zero, zero to one, zero to two, and so on. V prime prime going to V prime. But double prime, bizarrely, spectroscopists are, um, spectroscopists are um, a little bit uh, insane, so just random symbols. We have our double prime for the lower energy level and a single prime for the upper one. We've got all of these possible transitions. And as we can see, they're all, look, they're all occurring to different intensities, so there's different probabilities here, but they're all occurring. So our, our resulting spectrum is essentially an overlap of all of these and we get this spectrum that we would normally be used to in, uh, in the labs, this kind of broad, featureless spectrum. So the question is, well, why, why are some of these more intense or some of these um, less intense? So what, why is this middle one very intense and this one not very intense and so on? One, one thing before I get on to that, you can see that if you remember, and, and if I just go back to the home slide for a second, this is the spectrum of iodine gas. And you can see we're not getting broad featureless spectra. We're getting this very, very fine detailed spectrum, what we call fine structure. And that's because in this gas phase molecule, we're seeing the 0 to 0, the 0 to 1, the 0 to 2, each distinctly. We're seeing all, each of these ones distinct, in, uh, distinctly. They're not being kind of averaged out. And, and in general terms, in solution spectra, 
we tend not to see this fine structure because the molecules are constantly colliding off each other and banging off solvent and so on we tend not to see fine structure in solution phase spectra because with each collision this energy level might move just slightly up or just slightly down so suddenly it blurs together we're seeing lots of transitions but something slightly lower something slightly higher and so on but the overall average starts to blur out and we just see this kind of um, sort of um, uh, unresolved sort of broad featureless spectrum but in gas phase so this is sulfur dioxide you can see we're seeing the individual transitions whereas if this is a solution phase spectrum we would just probably see a, uh, a, a sort of a general a curved line you wouldn't see each of these individual details all right so the question then becomes what why do we see some peaks that are more intense and some peaks that are less intense and as I mentioned there are rules associated with symmetry that say which which orbital downstairs is going to overlap best with particular orbitals upstairs and the better that overlap the better the overlap of those wave functions the more probable and a transition will be. An important um, basis here is something called the Frank Condon principle. And the Frank Condon principle says that electronic transition happens so quickly that the molecule doesn't have any chance to, um, to reconfigure or rearrange or do anything uh, in the time scale of a transition. So when we look at an electronic transition, we draw it as a vertical line. And that seems trivial, but what that means is then the, the potential for overlap of the wave function downstairs, which is always b prime prime is equal to zero, and wave functions upstairs will depend on how different the electronic excited state is in terms of its electronic arrangement to the ground state. So if we have a higher state where there's very different electronic distribution, well then the nuclear configuration will be very different and the internuclear separation will be very different. Um, so this state here, you can see the minimum of this potential energy curve is quite right shifted to the one downstairs. So that might mean a overlap of downstairs wave function and upstairs wave function, for example, here is some, some much higher uh, energy level, and that will be the most intense transition. But the most intense transition is the one where we have the best overlap between the molecule downstairs, uh, sorry, the or orbital downstairs and the orbital upstairs. And this means then that when we look at electronic spectra, we might see some spectra where it looks like it's sort of um, you know, leaning to the right. So if you imagine a solution phase spectrum, this would just be kind of an average of all of this. So it would be sort of a, a, a peak where it's sort of much more intense on the right-hand side, whereas this is, will be a spectrum where the peak is much more intense on the left-hand side. And the reason is that it depends on how the molecule potential energy curve differs. So here it hasn't changed very much. Um, so we can see that um, the most intense transition might be, for example, 0 to 1 in this case, depending on how the wave functions um, can be defined. And here, because the nuclear configuration is very shifted to the right, for example, we're going from a pi star to an anti-bonding orbital. We're completely moving the electron density. If you think of those molecular orbitals and how they change, for completely moving the electron density um, away from bonding orbitals and putting into anti-bonding orbitals, this may have a very different effect on the nuclear configuration, in other words, the bond length and so on. So that might lead to a very different kind of absorption spectrum. So it's hard to go into more detail about that now, but what I want to try and get across to you is that when we look at these broad featureless spectra, oops, this one, there's a lot going on underneath the bonnet here. There's a lot, a lot happening. Um, in terms of vibrational information that we tend not to capture in normal solution phase spectra, but it's important to know for considering the shape and intensity of spectra that we get. All right, so that's pretty much what, what I wanted to cover. Um, the uh, appendix to the notes has some information on completing UV spectroscopy experimentally. I mean, this is a core technique that you really should make sure you know how to do um, well and sort of accurately and properly um, because it's such a routine technique that people tend to just try it as they go along and don't understand what's going on. All right, so just, you know, this is really just introducing electronic spectroscopy before you pick it up in much more detail next year.
But what we're trying to get across here is the core message in spectroscopy, whether it's rotational or vibrational or electronic, what we are interested in is quantifying the energies of states. And then what we see in the spectrometer is quantifying the differences um, in those energies. Because if a molecule, in this case, this blue line, if a molecule is in a spectrometer uh, and wavelength corresponding to that blue line comes from the source in the spectrometer, the molecule will absorb it so the detector on the other side will see that that wavelength is not coming through. And what that means is the molecule has absorbed energy and is using that energy to redistribute electron density uh, in, in the molecule. Okay, so I hope that course has given this course has given you some basis and some um, more detail on considering spectroscopy and spectroscopic um, transitions. Spectroscopy obviously is a core part of chemistry, and I think really what you want to take away from this, and among a sea of equations and so on, is, are those core principles of knowing energies of states and knowing the transitions between those states to give us a match of what we see in spectra. And hence, when you look at um, a spectrum as a spectroscopist, you can really get a sense of knowing why you're seeing the peak at a particular value and how you can use that to start to begin to characterize the molecule. So good luck with your course and good luck with the exams, and I'll see you on the discussion board and uh, in the live Q&A. Okay, take care.